<laughs> yeah, good. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, today we're here with uh, Christopher Birkbeck, who is a professor of criminology at uh, the University of Salford. Uh, thank you very much for having time to to receive me. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, uh, the research uh, uh, pertaining to restricted justice conferences. You were saying that uh, there's a lot of, well, not a lot of, but there's some research uh, in all the aspects leading to conferences yes. but not the conferences themselves yes yes it was what i was saying that that as research interest has go, grown you've seen a lot written around the, the antecedents and the philosophy of uh, restorative justice the ad advantages it can have the challenges it can face uh you see quite a lot of less research oriented stuff but more the practical guides on on how to conduct restorative justice conferences and then you see some research on the outcomes for the participants how did they feel about it was it a positive experience um, did it meet their expectations what are their thoughts afterwards and there is a little bit of research also trying to look at whether or not restorative justice uh, has an impact a positive impact on on reoffending rates but in all of this, everything seems to be focused on leading up to and leading away from the the center of, of, of the restorative justice uh, process, if you like. It's not the whole thing because there's a lot that goes on before mm -hmm. uh, people get to a conference. But that conference in and of itself is like the key point. And so, so the event of the meeting yes, between offender and, and, and victim. victim. Yes, that's where it would be really interesting. I think we can... Uh, it finds some very interesting results that would help to understand how restorative justice conferences take place. And our particular interest is in trying to identify what we would call turning points within a restorative justice conference, uh, because when participants come in, they may be nervous, they may be timid, uh, they may not uh, be particularly comfortable in the situation, and uh, if one's thinking about the whole process of reconciliation, which is what really interests us, uh, we want to use, would like to use certain techniques from uh, sociological theory and something called conversational analysis to look at uh, the patterns of interaction in that conference and to see if we can identify at which points uh, people begin to come together and talk cooperatively and collaboratively. There are ways that you can identify those things and see if we can uh, identify those moments and thereby understand a little more about what happens in a restorative justice conference and uh, understand a little more about how we might be able to look for those turning points or encourage them to happen. Mm -hmm. It's as if people come in under a cloud, under a dark cloud, and at some point in the conference, the clouds lift and disappear, and the sun comes out, and things are a little bit uh, brighter and clearer. That uh, may be a, uh, not a very good analogy, but uh, it actually has strong foundations in certain literary um, uh, roots as well. So that's we don't know much about what happens in a restorative justice conference itself. But I, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert at all in, in any of I. this. <laughs> I think you might know a bit more about this than, than I do. Um, I mean, it may have to do with the uh, basic human, uh, uh, um, how would I call it, the way humans feel, uh, basic instinct. Um, we all want, I mean, I may be wrong, but I think that people either avoid conflict or want to resolve conflict. I yes. think that uh, conflict that is unresolved uh, hangs around people and uh, we cannot deal with it uh, just being there. So reconciliation is an important uh, uh, event uh, when a crime has occurred. Yes. And I think that the forces at play there are, in, in, in a way, our own natural insti instinct to look for forgiveness or to actually forgive the person if you can see that that person may have been. Compassion. Compassion may play a role there as well. If you mm -hmm. see the victim, sorry, the offender, uh, has uh, had a tough upbringing and yes. a difficult uh, life up living to do the uh, crime, mm -hmm. uh, then you might, I think that we are programmed to feel compassion yes. in a way. Yes. And empathy. I would agree. Um, in a very different project that I'm working on, um, I'm looking at um, 
actually something in, not in this country but in Peru. Mm -hmm. um, the, there was a, a, a large amount of political violence in Peru in the 1980s and 1990s and about 10 years ago the Peruvian government set up a truth commission and brought the victims to testify publicly about their experiences. Uh, it was to a very set pattern uh, of interventions, they were quite structured, I think uh, the victims were screened and assessed in terms of what they were going to say. Uh, it was very much modelled on the South African Truth Commission, mm -hmm. but what I want to get at is, uh, in the absence of, uh, com uh, of, of conversation or interaction with the perpetrators, as we might call them, uh, it's very easy for victims uh, and for wider society to get into that uh, mode which treats the offenders as um, essentially just a shallow uh, profile of an individual who's a wrongdoer, mm -hmm. uh, but with no uh, human detail to, to add to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it becomes very much a situation in which victimhood is a narrative about goodness and innocence and vulnerability. And perpetration and offending is a narrative about evil, essentially. Mm -hmm. And they don't come together. Uh, the literary form of that is what we call melodrama, which is <laughs> very, very uh, widespread in media accounts and popular uh, writing and, and opinion about crime, uh, both in Latin America and North America and here. Mm -hmm. The Restorative Justice Conference is really interesting because it brings the victim and the offender together. Mm -hmm. And as you say, I think you're really correct. Empathy can begin to emerge when uh, each side begins to learn more about the other and they see each other, not in that one-dimensional one role mm -hmm. of victim and offender, but as mm -hmm. a as a human being. Well, I think it's very interesting how you were describing uh, what it looked like. Uh, victims were inherently good and they had mm -hmm. been attacked and uh, it was easier for them to uh, react to uh, an absent offender, yeah. uh, which takes then, um, you know, a general form mm -hmm. of uh, evil. Yes. But I think that, uh, I mean, from my conversations with other uh, people interested in RJ and practitioners as well. It's like uh, offenders when they're offending, uh, you know, it only downs on them that they're harming a person, a singular individual, when they're confronted uh, by that person at the conference. So to offenders, they don't realize that they're, they're causing harm to someone specifically until they're brought into a room with that person to, to express yes. what they feel. Yes, um, and there are many elements in criminological theory and criminological thinking which suggests that offenders neutralize the harm that they do and they find either excuses or justifications for what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and even offenders when talking about the targets they choose and what they've done will often show a rather distorted form of morality, but they will show that they have values too. Well, like that those have too much money or something like that. Yeah, well, the Robin Hood syndrome, yes, they have too much money or they wouldn't miss it. Um, or uh, even the person who says, well, I wouldn't rob that kind of person, you know, I wouldn't rob <laughs> money from a child or something they like that. They have principles. So, they, <laughs> they, of course, they have principles. And sometimes actually offending occurs because their principles are so strong, they get so indignant that they've been violated that they resort to violence or something else to mark that wrong that's been committed. So uh, sometimes offending can be a product of an overactive moralization of the situation. Yeah. Well, that's a, a novel take on it, but I think that, uh, I mean, it is novel to me. Yes. I imagine that in, in yeah. criminological circles there is uh, well established. Well, for example, there's a long-standing theory on what's known as the cultures of violence and subcultures of violence, which um, look at particular values held by certain groups, which uh, lead them to use violence to uphold and defend certain values, which to them are very important. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, honor killings, which happen in certain societies, honor you know that their killings to defend the honor of the family so mm -hmm. it, it's it, it were righteous indignation mm -hmm. uh, but of course it um, is expressed in a way which the law doesn't allow so the subculture or personal values may drive the person to that mm -hmm. 
um, and they are taking a, a, a strongly moral position. So they're actually doing a wrong. Yes. Whilst thinking that they're doing the right thing. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, that's for me. It's going to be going to be on a tangent. I don't know what you think about it, but uh, what about uh, crimes committed in the name of religion? And uh, we have this very fresh because only uh, last week we had uh, the bomb attacks yes. in Paris. Yes. Uh, what do I think about them? Um, the, the fact that uh, uh, criminal activity may be justified uh, through strong principles? Yes. Uh, exactly. I mean, in some cases, you could say religion can provide a justification for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the infidels and things yes. like that. Uh, and then you have also uh, this social, political, and geopolitical situation where one country is uh, waging a war in, an, mm -hmm. in another country, not of conquest, but yeah. uh, where they aim to be controlling the circumstances there. But that's resented by locals, and then that provides sort of a justification for certain individuals within those societies to feel aggraviated by. Yeah, um, maybe I would shift the terrain slightly towards. Um, Political, uh, politically motivated crime, because I think a lot, possibly a lot of what's called religiously motivated crime, ultimately has a strong political element in it. And if you think about it more in political terms, then you can also think about uh, other forms of terrorism, uh, both international and national. Um, I teach in one of my courses here at the university. Um, one of our classes in criminology, we look at the case of Timothy McVeigh, uh, who was uh, convicted and then uh, executed for, I think, uh, in the mid-90s, it was the worst act of homegrown terrorism they had faced. He blew up a truck outside a federal building in Oklahoma oh, and yes. killed 168 Victims, I think, among them some children who were tragically small children in a daycare centre on, mm -hmm. on that side of the building. Now, Timothy McVeigh was a former military personnel, and uh, he had very clear political views and um, uh, actually argued that both directly and indirectly throughout his, his trial. He didn't consider himself to be a bad person. He considered himself to be fighting using violence for um, legitimate purposes, even though he was in a minority position. And if you think about the terrorist attacks in the 70s and 80s in England um, from Irish Republicans, again, mm -hmm. they felt they had that, that they were defending the right political and therefore moral position. Uh, that's, that's an argument that runs quite deep in Hollywood of all places where mm. you see films with that uh, you have the single hero that fights against the corrupt yes. state yeah and uh, mm -hmm. you know that gives that person the authority the moral authority to go and attack the system yes yeah yes it does and um, so yes uh, well many films have got a, <laughs> a moral uh, you know the, the, um, a lot of literature and fiction is built around this moral distinction between the good and the bad. Which mm. particular side is taken in a particular film, whether they're terrorists or whether they're freedom fighters in the old uh, Reagan, Ronald Reagan distinction, yeah. uh, based on political convenience really, is, is a matter of whose, whose side you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, you do have to look at both sides. There are very few individuals, I think, who are uh, out to... Uh, be proud to be bad in other words that they uh, they know what the rules are and they want to be openly immoral and um, break all of all of the rules that society has around mm -hmm. around violence you see that in some gang activity where gang members get get uh, very attracted by the idea of doing evil uh, but you also see it with some serial killers as well, I think, you know, mm -hmm. who are attracted by that idea. But certainly organised political violence usually has a strong moral element. Um, it's it's considered justifiable. Mm -hmm. What about petty crime? Well, you have, uh, uh, we have mentioned that before. You know, you have uh, young people perhaps mm -hmm. that are disenfranchised. Yeah. They see no opportunity in their lives and mm -hmm. then they feel entitled in a way, to take whatever they want uh, in an illicit way because they're never going to get it uh, through ordinary means. 
Ah, okay, yes. Uh, we, we sort of keep talking around um, a particular sociological theory of crime. We've talked about the rebels, now we're talking about those who innovate, those who <laughs> can't reach the same goals that everybody else has by legitimate means, so they, they take the illegitimate, you know, the illegal route. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the typical examples would be people who, for example, deal in drugs to get the money to be able to uh, acquire and exhibit those status symbols that are so important to everybody. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, and in that case, uh, potentially you are dealing with people who don't think about the moral consequences of what they've done. Not everybody thinks in moral terms about what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, who does not who doesn't is a rather difficult question to answer. Um, but th there may be, there may be, again, um, uh, forms of neutralizing the wrong, you know, in other words, they, they want to get this, uh, they, they need to acquire these things, they may find ways to justify or excuse their illegal behavior. Mm -hmm. um, because most people essentially want to present an image of themselves as respectable People who are well, people who are deserving of respect mm -hmm. in whatever they might have done. So acceptance in society. Uh, some people may pretend that they don't care about it, but uh, generally we're programmed to care about uh, what our peers think about us. Of course, yes, and where in some groups disrespect will lead to violence. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm just thinking that mm -hmm. this uh, theory, which you work with generally in criminology. Uh, could be very useful uh, for people evaluating, assessing uh, potential candidates for uh, restorative justice processes. That is, um, offenders uh, that uh, uh, you know are going to be evaluated to see if uh, their case is suitable yes. for restorative justice. Yeah. Yeah. Because obviously, uh, some cases you could see in some cases where the offender was actually a victim as well and yes. uh, that doesn't negate the fact that uh, what uh, that person did was wrong but uh, there are mitigating factors if mm -hmm. you want whereas in some of the cases uh, those mitigating factors may be only visible to the offender himself mm -hmm. yes so uh, what you're saying is that that uh, obviously as, as, as restorative justice programs seem to need to do you've got to look at the general attitude of the person you approach as an offender mm -hmm. um, in terms of whether or not there's an opening for them to go part way towards meeting the victim mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, thinking about ways that um, what, you know we might explain what they've done and that mm -hmm. they might explain what they've done uh, in ways that would be acceptable to a victim mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of Work goes on there, I think, to to make sure because if somebody were to walk into a restorative justice conference and say, "I did it, didn't think about it, and actually I couldn't care less," um, <laughs> that's not a recipe for success. Uh, there might be victims who are very resilient who could say, "Well, hold on, let's talk about this," mm -hmm. you know, and uh, who could come back and um, uh, actually try to explore. The yes, actually explore that. But often you you might think that you need almost not a mediator, but uh, the, the the restorative justice facilitator would have to take a fairly strong role there, wouldn't mm -hmm. they? Yeah. Well, I I'm not sure that a case like that would actually make it to this stage no. where you have a, an encounter between victim and offender. Um, I was just thinking this happens uh, in in youth cases. Uh, where people have been through what they perceive to be tough times. Um, yes. I mean, the perception of uh, how hard your life has been mm -hmm. to that point is subjective because yeah. uh, people that are from another generation would think mm -hmm. we didn't have this, we didn't have that, yes. and nothing happened. Whereas these days, uh, like in material uh, things, mm. uh, it means that you're not uh, busy with your peers. Yes. And that could be uh, a justification to some people to commit crime, yeah. for example, feeling that they, they, they don't have what they deserve. In other cases, you have people that may come from uh, broken families mm -hmm. and uh, may have had to... Uh... Yes, um, that's really interesting and perhaps I'm going to be a little polemical here because 
Uh, we like <laughs> we like that. In, on the <laughs> one of the one of the things I'll say is that in a sense, what we're saying is if the offender gives an account of themselves which shows that they are also victims, mm -hmm. then what you have is a way for both the victim and the offender victim to come together. In other words, the victim of this incident recognizes that the offender is in turn a mm -hmm. victim. And so um, they're able to find some common ground there. Mm -hmm. But the sort of sociology and criminology that interests me would see those as narratives that people assume mm -hmm. uh, and take on. And there are narratives of victimhood which are important and very interesting but may not be always the most helpful in terms of moving forwards. Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer to this, but what I will say is that uh, if you look at literature again, and if you look at the way in which people come together in reconciliation, um, even you know you can study classic literary theorists and go all the way back to to, to classical times as well. Reconciliation is usually found in uh, what is classically called comedy. But not humour. Not, I'm not saying comedy is humorous. Mm -hmm. Comedies bring people together. And you'll often see in literary criticism that comedies, the function of comedy is to effect a reconciliation between the parties. If people come together in terms of victimhood, uh, you are often looking either at tragedy, uh, which talks about personal weaknesses and um, may lead to some... Uh, self-knowledge, greater self-knowledge in terms of what, what is being said, but it may not lead to reconciliation either. Um, and so my, my polemical hypothesis is that uh, restorative justice it would be most successful if the frames that are used are comedy frames. But again, I have to stress I'm not talking about humour. We're talking about things that cause harm, that that affect people very seriously. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the classic literary notion of comedy, which, talk, which deals with turning points where people begin to understand who the other person is, there is empathy, and mm -hmm. suddenly they realise that they are able to get on and come together on things. So, so uh, again, from a non-expert yeah. side, would you be talking about uh, using RJ in the most serious cases because that's where feelings are most important? So not when a, a window is broken, but when you know someone has been attacked, physical attack, for example, things like that. I no, I think um, re reconciliation, if it will work, should 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 be it should be theoretically possible for it to occur, whatever the level of conflict and whatever mm -hmm. the level of harm. There are clearly practical considerations around whether or not a, a process of reconciliation can be initiated. Uh, what I don't have the answer to is how exactly you would engineer a conference that leads to reconciliation looking from a different perspective. Um, one of the, the things that I'm really interested in looking at in restorative justice conferences is precisely these frames that people come bring to them because a restorative justice conference is a script if you like it's yes. a drama well, as it, well. It, from, from the point of view of the practitioner it yeah. is practically a script because yes. uh, there are stages that have been studied but yes. perhaps not uh, with sufficient depth yes yeah so there is a script there but it's also a drama and people are engaged in representing themselves and the the, the key question is how does that drama reach a conclusion um, does it end as tragedy uh, does it end as a, 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 a farce? Is it an adventure? Is it a journey? Um, or it, is it melodrama where they never come together and the good are on this side and they're rejecting the bad on that side? Uh, there are a number of different ways. So uh, it is. I think it's possible to uh, look at the, the way in which people present themselves and then think about how that may help to work towards a process of reconciliation. And coming back to the, the victims of the violence in Peru, because of the way that whole thing is structured, they come in with a sense of tragedy, but essentially a sense of melodrama. And melodrama is not going to produce reconciliation. Um, and so, uh, this is no criticism directly of the work of the Peruvian Truth Commission, but I think there are questions to be asked about 
whether truth commissions in general, are facilitating reconciliation processes with some of the things that they do. Uh, what about closure? Because uh, I'm thinking that uh, these commissions of truth would be a bit like, uh, in normal terms here, like uh, me feeling aggrieved and talking to my relative about what happened to me. So letting yeah. go a bit. Yes. Uh, having you know, letting some steam off, mm -hmm. if you like, about the conflict or about the situation yep. or the offence, whereas uh, confronting the offender is completely different in the sense yes. that you have to come to terms with uh, the fact that uh, there is some other person that did that for a number of reasons. Yes. And, uh, you know, that had an effect on you. So you're not just... As soon as you have the other person present, it makes it completely alters the situation. Um, in a restorative justice conference, I repeat, I haven't studied any in, in, in great detail. I've read about them. Uh, we're hoping to do that, but you would, you know, you typically expect that the victim would come in and they'll be asked to give an account from their side, and that would be possibly fairly similar to what a victim might report in a public hearing. For a truth commission, this happened to me. But then, as it moves forward, you would begin to see things sh shift because they are hearing the other side. They're hearing what the offender says, and then um, they're being asked to think about, well, what does that mean to me? Uh, is there any way forward on this? Or what questions do I have about this? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, to move from two separate uh, intervention to some joint conversational discursive production um, and that's where the turning points might come well that's really interesting yeah um, I'm thinking you're looking for uh, the opportunity to witness uh, RG conferences yes um, we are hoping uh, we're hoping to use two techniques one is um, our colleague Rachel who's um, uh, doing her doctoral research on this is planning to apply conversational analysis. It's already been done partly in relation to one conference by Meredith Rossner who published in the British Journal of Criminology a really interesting article. Conversational analysis is very detailed so you don't need many um, restorative justice conferences to be able to uh, apply that, that technique. Um, and so we are hoping uh, to be able to record somewhere between five and ten restorative justice conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be comple kept completely confidential. We would not release them to anybody else. Um, and so it, it would be for research purposes. And anything that we publish from that will conceal the identity of the participants. Um, we've had a brief chat to some practitioners in the greater Manchester area who have said, well, Yes, we can ask them if they'd be interested in doing that because it's not for the media but for research. It might be. Mm. It's not going to end up in the Sun's website. No, it's <laughs> definitely not. Definitely not. Um, preferably uh, audio visual recording rather than just audio recording because conversational analysis also doesn't just look at what people say but it also looks at facial expressions and mm -hmm. things like that. And on that same sample, I could. I'm really interested in looking at a much broader level around the frames, the accounts that people give, the presentational strategies, what drama is being mm -hmm. uh, carried forward in, in these events. Um, and so uh, if, you know, our, our request to do that can be included in, uh, in some restorative justice conference paperwork um, so that the participants say yes, the facilitator, say, facilitator says yes, and we can actually get to do that. We think it would be really, really important. It would give us a lot of knowledge, and it would ultimately lead, I think, to more knowledge for practitioners, because mm -hmm. we can talk about these these frames, these turning points, and that kind of thing. Well, I'm completely sold on the idea. Would you be yeah. happy for me to post your email address? Yes, most definitely. And then anyone who has access to these recordings or can have yes. access to contact you directly? But, uh, yes, because obviously, whichever uh, restorative justice program we work with, because we can keep everything confidential, we can then share particularly with them the insights from our research you know and and it's a little bit like you say there's a lot of people who think no we shouldn't because it's difficult but researchers often ask those sort of more cheeky questions well why don't we we we're not going to publicize this but the as i said the restorative justice conference is the center of it all 
and yet it's like a black box. We know what goes in, we know what comes out, but what goes on in there? Is it that difficult to, uh, would it be that difficult to, to get people to allow us to, to listen and watch? Mm -hmm. We hope not. And also, uh, I suppose that uh, there is this uh, incentive for the profession to uh, provide evidence that the RJ works and why it does. So that requires analysis and research and uh, it requires yes. uh, uh, researchers like yourself to yes. have access to projects yes. and to conferences. Uh, I, I would agree. I mean, uh, I think in, these days any major and serious intervention or, or, or program in in the field of criminal justice is, is looking for research to systematically explore what's happening so that it's not just anecdotal information or particular experts talking. And I know there is a lot of work going on in restorative justice. We are just coming into this field because of particular things that interest us. Um, and uh, I think we're very, very clear that the the great thing about this is that we could in enhance our understanding very greatly about very general processes, but also provide some really concrete information that would be fantastic to discuss with practitioners. Well, I really hope that you get uh, some people interested in that. Thank I, you. I am interested, but Good. I'm not in a position to <laughs> offer you anything. No, so, no. Um, uh, what I would say is, uh, Christopher, thank you very much for well, your time. Thank you. Um, it has been. been very, uh, it's been very interesting for me too. Uh, I hope mm -hmm. that people have found it interesting. I have found yes. it extremely Good. interesting. I really Good. Good. That. Thank so you thank very you very much. much. Good. Mm -hmm.